Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. This week, we are going to talk about the UK closing their children's meat grinder gender clinic while the US continues to plow ahead castrating children and cutting off their breasts. Then we're going to look at how Munchausen syndrome by proxy is happening right out in the open on national television, and everyone acts as though it's not insanity. Then we're gonna talk about women who complain about men who harass feminists while it's actually other women who are harassing them. And finally, we're gonna talk about how the Borg came to earth and did sort of a half-assed assimilation job before leaving in disgust when they learned about chest feeding because they did not come here to have a crossover episode with aliens okay but first i i have to get this out before i forget ladies i have some dating advice for you don't date men who call trousers a pant because he's gay and he's insufferable and actually um Gay men, consider this advice to you as well. You don't want insufferable men like this, do you? You don't want to date somebody who speaks to you as if he were reading the script for a fashion commercial, unless it's me because I'm cute when I do it. All right. If you haven't heard of the Tavistock Clinic, it's a clinic in England, in the UK, the premier child psychiatry clinic that had turned into what my British friend Dennis Kavanaugh calls a gender abattoir, that is, a slaughtering house. And he's absolutely correct. It is a gender abattoir. They butcher children there, chemically and physically. Uh, actually, I don't know if the physical uh, stuff happens there, but they get them ready for it. So last week, Britain's National Health Service said that it was closing the Tavistock Clinic, and this is the largest gender clinic in the UK for children. Thousands of children have been put through the Tavistock. There's been a lot of crying out about what's been going on here for years, and I don't know why it's taken so long for people to listen, but they do appear to be listening now. And the NHS hired Dr. Hilary Cass uh, to write a report on what was going on at the Tavistock, and it was her conclusions in this report uh, that really helped make the case for closing it. And what she found was that the Tavistock did not keep data on the progress of children after they'd started them on puberty blockers. They simply did not keep notes. You've got to understand, you probably do, but I need to point it out. This is such, this is so basic. This is like not having a chart for your patient, right? This is not a small oversight. It's not an accident. There's no possible way it could be an accident for them not to chart the progress, noting how well or how poorly these kids do. They didn't forget to do it, or whatever their excuse is. They deliberately didn't do it because they knew that these children were having negative outcomes. They knew. They didn't follow up on kids after they left the system or after they um, stopped treatment or started taking treatment somewhere else. Again, they knew this. This is very basic standard stuff. It was a conscious choice on their part to break these basic medical protocols. And the report also noted that many of the staff there had turned whistleblower, and they were saying that there was just huge pressure among the staff to affirm every kid, to tell every child that came in, yes, you are born in the wrong body. If, if you have a penis, you are in fact a girl. If you have a vagina, you are in fact a boy. One staff member grimly joked at that, that by the time the Tavistock was done with their work, there wouldn't be any gay people left because they're transing away the gay. Grim joke, yeah, and I would have laughed about it too, but it's absolutely true. That is literally what they're doing. The vast majority of these children would turn out to be homosexuals. This, this, this is conversion therapy under the knife, the literal knife. This has all been long known well before this report, and feminists and gay rights campaigners have been documenting it and screaming about it for years. The people at the Tavistock knew they were doing wrong. The National Health Service knew they were doing wrong. They didn't care, because butchering children was more important than not butchering children. End of story. But the closure of the Tavistock 
I, I think people are being a little premature in their celebration. It's not an unalloyed good. The NHS and the media, and I realize they're spinning this, uh, but they need to be watched very, very carefully. We have not had a victory yet. If, if, if you're a listener in the UK, you're not done. The victory did not happen. You are now on alert that we're moving in the right direction, but you have to keep the same level of scrutiny and intensity up because what do they want to do? What does the NHS want to do? They want to spin off the Tavistock's role into numerous additional and new community-based clinics. So does that mean that we're going to have 16 gender slaughterhouses instead of just one? That will not be a victory, right? Please stop clapping so loud. Everybody who thinks you won, we haven't won yet. It's progress, yeah, but we haven't won yet. Remember what you learned over the past two years. Remember what you learned about the character of people. Remember how many seriously psychiatrically deranged people there are at the top of this ladder. And remember what you learned, which is probably even worse, that about 80% of the population will go along with horror and butchery and suppression of freedom without saying anything. Don't forget that you learned that. Now you know what humans are like. Retain that knowledge for the rest of your life because it's the way humans are. Lawyers have announced that they're lost. Um, they are gathering client families and launching a massive class action lawsuit against the National Health Service. Now, lawyers like to talk themselves up. I've seen headlines, you know, thousands and thousands of families. They don't know this, and that sounds like a little bit of hype. But reckoning is coming. Meanwhile, in the U.S., though, here, it's full steam ahead. The Biden administration is rewriting the literal reality of sex in regulation. We've shown you this on the show. You can confirm it for yourself. They've announced that they believe that there are, in fact, trans children. That's real, according to the White House. They've announced that butchering them, they don't call it that. They call it gender-affirming care because... That's what the devil does. The devil does reversals. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. Not just butchering them, but psychologically torturing them. I don't think that gets enough attention. We may have to do a segment on the show about that. Even before you get to the knife, what's happening to these children, what they're being told, is, 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 like, is like an experiment that would never have passed an ethical institutional review board. Never. It's something on the level or in the neighborhood of an experiment that some sick people have wanted to do, maybe maybe actually have, but it's the sort of thing like, well, let's see what happens to a child's language and personality development if we deprive them of human contact or if we lie to them completely or we, you know. This is the kind of stuff that they are doing right now, today, and have been doing, that if it were put into a proposal, would never pass an ethical standard. But it's now normal. This isn't going to stop in, in the U.S. until thousands more children are maimed, unfortunately. That is going to happen. There's going to be a lot more butchery. Prepare yourself for it. Because look at this from Boston Children's Hospital. Can we roll that clip, Kevin, please? Gender-affirming hysterectomy is very similar to most hysterectomies that occur. A hysterectomy itself is the removal of the uterus, the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus, and the fallopian tubes, which are attached to the sides of the uterus. Some gender-affirming hysterectomies will also include the removal of the ovaries, but that's technically a separate procedure called a bilateral oophorectomy. And not every gender-affirming hysterectomy includes that, and people who are getting gender-affirming hysterectomies do not have to have their ovaries removed. Boston Children's Hospital. If you've watched this show before, you can pick out many of the tells that I'm going to talk about here. Here's the camouflage that this woman is using. This is Dr. Frances Grimstad. If you're just watching, she appears to be about somewhere between 35 and 40. So, let me list out the camouflage that this very sick and disturbed individual is using to stop you from noticing that she is sick and disturbed. 
Number one, I mean, she's not using this. This is just her. But this is how this works. She's a woman, number one. Your, your trust level is automatically higher for her as a woman than it would be for a man. She can get away with saying exactly the same things and proposing exactly the same monstrous surgical activity that she could not get away with if she were a male because we are more sympathetic to women. Stop doing that. Cutesy baby voice. Well, <laughs> gender affirming hysterectomies. <laughs> the little, um, little hunched over shoulders, you know, because she's small and cute and female. She's harmless. Small and sweet. Giggly affect. Happy, gentle, uplifting music. Did you hear her? Gender affirming hysterectomies. Gender affirming hysterectomies. Now, of course, Boston Children's Abattoir removed this video as soon as they got pushed back because they know that they're doing evil. This is a conscious choice. They know what they're doing, and they like it. So how did people react to this? Thankfully, from mostly from what I saw with horror, which is good. But the online feminists, that was a different story. I saw a variation of this very frequently. I hope somebody was making her do this and she doesn't really believe it. Huh? Let me ask you some questions about that. Is that you? Anybody listening or watching? Is that a thought that occurred to you? Then I'm asking these questions of you. Can you make somebody rape someone else? Yeah, I know. I know you can find a situation in which that can happen. I know that you could talk about introducing a gun. I realize that. You know that I'm not talking about that. Can you make somebody cut a girl's tits off? Is that something you enforce people to do? Can you make somebody cut a boy's testicles off? Actually, don't, don't answer that last one, because I don't want to know, actually. I suspect there are some out there who find that less disturbing, because it's a boy child. So I'd really rather not know that. Ladies, that's it. Feminists, that's it. From now on, we're going to... We're going to talk about the matriarchy. I'm going to be talking about the devouring, toxic, psychotic matriarchy. The psychopathic matriarchy that has structured our culture. Yeah? Get ready. You're going to hear a lot more about it. Then you're going to know what it feels like to have to listen to all the bullshit about patriarchy when it's actually women who are doing it. So we're going to talk about the matriarchy. That's a thing. What you're looking at with a person like this is a profoundly psychiatrically disturbed woman. This Dr. Grimstad. Nobody's making her do this. If she had a moral conscience of her own, she would have resigned the very moment that Boston Children's Hospital started offering gender-affirming care. Well, not the very moment. She would have tried to stop it, and then she would have been a whistleblower, but she certainly wouldn't have taken her scalpel out, would she? Nobody's making her do anything. She's a fully grown woman, feminist. She's a fully grown woman. She has agency. She's an adult. She went through medical school. No one's making her. This is you. Okay? She's a butcher. These women are Gorgons, Medusas, Medeas. I probably shouldn't have said Medusa because somebody out there is going to defend Medusa. Got a little bit of feminist sympathy. She's probably one of your icons because she was traumatized by rape, wasn't she? So she's really getting her own back. Medusa is. Because one man harmed her. She's allowed to turn every man she encounters into stone. That's reasonable and proportionate, isn't it, feminists? I know you. I used to be friends with you. <laughs> I know how your mind works. Munchausen syndrome by proxy. You've heard of this before. It's the illness, and, and if you're listening, hear the air quotes, illness that drives mothers to poison their children. 
or to falsely claim that their child has a deadly disease in order to get attention for mommy's virtuous heroism. You have no trouble recognizing this when you see a classic case. Maybe mommy's giving little Jane syrup of Ipecac to make her throw up. Maybe she is surreptitiously injecting little Johnny with insulin and the doctors are absolutely baffled because little Johnny is not a type 1 diabetic. How can he be having hypoglycemic blood crashes, blood sugar crashes that look like what happens to a diabetic? Hmm. Do you know what I mean? I, I've seen cases like this before. They've been in true crime documentaries. It's absolutely astonishing to me how long it takes medical teams to figure out why a child is having hypoglycemic crashes. I'm not a doctor and I know immediately it's because somebody injected insulin, you fools. You know why they can't figure it out? I'll give you a moment. Write your answer down. Yeah, that's right. No mommy would ever do that. It must be a medical rarity. Horse hooves, not zebra hooves, doctors. Here's how WebMD describes Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Quote, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a psychological disorder marked by attention-seeking behavior by a caregiver through those who are in their care. Next quote. MSP is a relatively rare behavioral disorder. It affects a primary caretaker, often the mother. The person with MSP gains attention by seeking medical help for exaggerated or made-up symptoms of a child in their care. As health care providers strive to identify what ca what's causing the child's symptoms, the deliberate actions of the parent or caretaker can often make the, uh, the symptoms worse. No. Well, let me stop you right there, WebMD. It doesn't affect the primary caretaker. It affects the victim, the child. I don't have time for the rant that I wanted to go off on, but, but I'm get, maybe I'll do that next week. I get real goddamn sick of hearing people when they see somebody who goes out, like Anne Heche, crashes her car, gets drunk, crashes her car into a private home, and the whole thing burns down. And the first thing people say when they see is, oh, poor Anne Hayes, she needs help. Fuck you. Do you know who needs help? The people whose house she burned down. Do you know who Munchausen syndrome by proxy affects? The victim, the child. She doesn't need help. She needs isolated and away from children. Mm. And no, it's not often the mother, WebMD. It is nearly universally the mother. This is a mother's sin. This is a female evil. Males have their evil. This is female. Men who are deranged to this degree usually rape or beat their daughters. That's toxic masculinity. This, this poisoning, which is what this is, it's poisoning. Poisoning for pity points, that's a woman's evil. Just as poisoning has always been the murder weapon of choice for evil women. Look at how the medical authorities, I'm going to coin a term, femwash this. Next quote. While healthcare providers are often unable to identify the specific cause of the child's illness, they may not suspect the parent or caretaker of doing anything to harm the child. In fact, the caregiver often appears to be very loving and caring and extremely distraught over the child's illness. No, again, not the caregiver, the mother, WebMD. Healthcare providers don't suspect the mother is doing this because she's a mother. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's that stupid. And look how distraught she is. Look how many big tears. She must really, really care. Munchausen syndrome by proxy ought to be at the very top of their list of hypotheses when a child presents with such a mysterious illness. It ought to be one of the first things they look for, not one of the last things they look for. There's no excuse for this. Take a look at this graphic. What causes Munchausen syndrome by proxy? The exact cause of MSP is not known, but researchers are looking at the roles of biological and psychological factors in its development. Some theories suggest that a history of abuse or neglect as a child or the early loss of a parent may be factors in its development. Some evidence suggests that major stress, such as marital problems, can trigger MSP. Stop it. Stop it. 
marital stress. Marital stress can trigger you to poison your child, Jesus Christ. First of all, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is not a standalone illness. It's a symptomatic expression and an outward directed act of abuse from borderline or another cluster B personality disorder. Yes, there is literature that shows this link. No, it's not definitive. No, there is not one study out there that absolutely says it is. You don't need a study to see this. Simple human deduction will take you here. Horse hooves, not zebra hooves. We're going to see another example of it right here. But first, I have to say to NBC News, whose clip we're going to play here, shame on you. Shame on you. I do not believe that no one on your crew saw what was going on. I don't believe you. You don't believe you either, you cowards. I know that you know, NBC News crew, that this little boy that we're about to see is not a girl. You know that. Yet you play along, you bastards. Let's play the clip, Kevin, please. Nine-year-old Kieran Clausen collects crystals. She dabbles in face paint, and she loves sports. What do you play? I did play volleyball, soccer, and I want to play basketball. To Kieran, who's transgender, it's not about racking up victories. I don't want to win any trophies for it, though. I feel like that's the most most unfair way to compete because it's not about winning. What's it about? Having fun with your friends for it though. I feel like that's the mo most unfair way to compete because it's not about winning. Kieran seems undeterred with a message now about her journey. Never stop being you. That's it. Never stop being you. There's so many kids that don't even have the opportunity to express who they really are. We are acknowledging more people as who they are than taking something away from somebody else. If you are listening to this episode, I urge you, as I often do, to go on YouTube. I want you to put your eyes on this. You need to see what we're talking about. Those of you who are watching, did you see it? Did you note it? This woman this mother, while her little child was robotically reciting a script, mommy was mouthing it. It was almost unconscious. You can see her lips moving. You can see her rehearsing the script and making sure that her son repeats it verbatim. It's right there on camera. Look at that sick woman. Look at that sick mother. Look at her pretending to cry. <laughs> they don't even get a chance to be themselves. Fuck you. She's pretending because she gets pleasure out of this. This makes her happy. I suspect she gets another kind of pleasure out of it too. Yes. The little kid says, I did play volleyball, soccer, and, and then he looks over at his mother for a prompt. That's my mother. That crumpled face and that weak little crying voice. Oh, I'm so sympathetic and big hearted. And when, you know, the thought of any child coming to any harm just makes me fall over into a pile of tears. I'm so empathetic. Actually, my mother's better than this. My mother is a better actress. My mother can actually and does cry on cue. She can produce real tears. This one couldn't even do it. Dollar store performance. That's it. That's enough of that. Time for a break. See you afterwards. You know how podcasters are always asking you to hit the subscribe button? Well, this is us asking you to take a minute right now and be sure you've hit subscribe on your favorite video platform. Click that notification bell too, so you never miss our newest content. And don't forget to subscribe on audio too. We have audio only content that you won't find on any video platform, so don't miss out. Do you like Disaffected? Do you like it enough to help pay for it? We'd love to have your support to grow and maintain this show. 
Donors get special access to our monthly Zoom Hangouts. They're off camera and unscripted. We talk about what you want to talk about. There are two ways to join. Patreon users can go to patreon.com slash disaffected or visit subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Welcome back. Item from Vice News. Mexico City may not be as diverse as we thought. As Californians and other Americans arrive in Mexico City, many have noted the lack of black culture and black representation in the city. <laughs> I swear to God. When I first saw this headline, I thought I was reading a parody of Vice magazine. I really did. You can't satire is dead. You cannot tell the difference anymore. Of course it's Californians going to Mexico. Where do you think you are? Hey, hey, Californians, you idiots. Where do you think you got on a plane to go to? Who do you think who do you believe lives in Mexico? The answer is Mexicans. Black, notice the capital is that black culture capitalized. Black representation. Honey, these people are Mexicans who live in their own country, who live in Mexico City. They don't have your particular fetishes. Are you actually surprised? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what is it with these people? We got some similar... <laughs> it's not similar, but it's all part of the same thought process. Look at this stuff from... Oh, my God. What is this from? I got to get my glasses out here. Oh, yeah, from The Guardian. Okay, so here, <laughs> here's a picture, a drawing, a cartoon drawing... Um, it's full of what I assume, it's from New Zealand, it, it's depicting, um, I was going to say New Zealish, it's in New Zealish. <laughs> um, it's not in New Zealish, it's in um, whatever the Aboriginal language is that is most common to New Zealand. I am so sorry that I do not know it. I am sorry for being a racist. So... It's, one, again, one of those crudely drawn cartoon images, cartoon, uh, computer cartoon, right? Nobody, nobody has any talent anymore. Um, notice the lack of mouths on their faces. This, seriously, look at this. How many, how many episodes of this show have we showed you art like this that was missing facial features, but all of them have been missing mouths? Don't tell me that's a coincidence. No, I don't think everybody's sitting there and deciding, you know, okay, we're going to conspire to not put mouths in here for this specific reason. I don't think it's that conscious, but I do think it betrays a psychological disposition that scares me. So the image is of a woman. Oh, and, and it, both of them, mom and dad, of course, are obese. Um, yes, I know. I know that you've been trained over the past few years to look at that and say that's not obese, but it is. Um Mom is sitting on the couch with what appears to be some sort of Borg contraption strapped to her tits. I think it's some sort of electric milking pump. Um, it doesn't look very much like what I remember from my uncle's dairy farm, but of course, there's only two breasts, not six per person. Dad is sitting on the floor, uh, also mouthless, with a baby. He's holding a baby to his breast as if he had a breast to feed. And the baby is drinking, I hope that's mother's milk, from a bottle that is hanging around this guy's neck. So apparently it's not enough for dad to bottle feed the kid. He has to pretend that he has tits. So <laughs> I guess this isn't exactly connected to uh, this article I'm going to show you from The Guardian. It's conceptually connected, but... Um, the Guardian didn't actually run this, so let me correct myself. And the bottom it says... Find your breastfeeding support. Find your breastfeeding support. I guess that's the name of the organization. What a terrible name. Is 
AOTRA's first and only National Breastfeeding Support Services Directory. Create a listing or find support at findyourbreastfeedingsupport.org.nz. <laughs> I'm going to do a racist. When I was reading this, because it's got the, the Aboriginal language on here, Mana Kitia E to Tuonga. I was reminded of one of my favorite uh, one of my favorite scenes from I think series one of Absolutely Fabulous, the original in the early 1990s, when um, Safi, the daughter, has her friend over, and I can't remember her friend's name because I'm a racist. I only remember her as the Asian chick. Uh, but Jennifer Saunders, Eddie, on the show is just terror. She's an actual racist. <laughs> this, oh, I think it's Sarah. I think her name is Sarah, and she's super annoying. And Jennifer Saunders just goes, "Can you can Titty Kaka over here just shut up for a moment?" <laughs> okay, let's go to the Guardian. So this is. RCOG advises greater support for trans men chest feeding babies. And we have a lovely picture here of baby feet. I assume they're baby feet. Who knows these days? Draft guidelines aim to improve obstetric and gynecological care for trans and gender diverse people. So, the Tavistock Abattoir is closing, but the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists wants to give so called trans men who allegedly do something called chest feeding what they call more support get them a properly fitted maternity bra you know the thing you need when you don't cut your tits off here's a quote the royal college of obstetricians and gynecologists says trans men should be asked about their preferred manner of feeding before their baby is born and those who opt to chest feed should be offered chest feeding support in the same manner as for cis women. Their preferred manner of feeding? What does that even mean? What does that mean? Next quote. The document, and they're referring to a draft set of guidelines about how trans men are to be treated when they manfully give birth and manfully don't breastfeed. The document, which has been put out for consultation until September 6th, makes a series of recommendations to help improve care. It calls for trans and gender diverse people to be offered advice and about fertility preservation when considering gender affirming surgery or hormone therapies. Thank you, The Guardian. So what is it that they recommend for chest feeders? Well, if you're taking what they call masculinizing hormones, stop them as soon as possible. Okay. I'm actually shocked that they said that. Literally. I, I'm shocked that they said it. Because why should they stop? What would be the reason to make that recommendation? Why should they stop doing that? It can't be because it might hurt the child to drink synthetic testosterone and breast milk. That can't be right. It can't be the reason because... The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists doesn't recognize children as having needs. That, that's clear. Well, where are you coming up with that from, Josh? Right, in their, right from their own actions. Do you see any recognition here that the infant or the child has any needs whatsoever? The answer is no, you don't, unless you're making it up because you don't want to believe these people are as sick as they are. Only the narcissistic borderline women who want to chest feed and be called men, they are the only people whose needs are recognized by the RCOG. It also recommends, in another quote, it, the guideline document, calls for trans and gender diverse people to be offered advice about fertility preservation when considering gender affirming surgery or hormone therapies. Let me translate that into plain English for you. The National Health Service, according to the Royal College, should pay the tens of thousands of pounds for each person that it costs to do things like freeze embryos from crazy women who want to be men, but also who want to get pregnant later and not be questioned about how they can possibly tolerate being pregnant because of their alleged gender dysphoria. Um, or maybe they, they want to freeze their eggs um, because they'll get a womb from a surrogate, you know, a birthing parent. 
I hope you British taxpayers feel that you're getting best value for your contributions because this is going to cost you. The quote, the Royal College also recommended that people should be addressed and referred to by their preferred title, name, pronouns and family relationships. <laughs> Another one. Here's a quote from their president, the Royal College's president. The RCOG president, Edward Morris, said this is an important guideline which aims to improve the care and experiences of transgender and gender diverse individuals accessing obstetric and gynecological services. Sadly, Trans and gender diverse individuals say they often feel judged and misunderstood by the health service. Well, that's because nobody understands you because you're insane. And the things that you say about yourself are insane. Nobody understands you. You don't understand you. Sadly, they should feel judged. They should feel a lot more judged than they do feel right now. You should be judging them. You, Royal College, you should be judging them. Why aren't you judging them in a truly compassionate way that recognizes that what's really going on here is a very severe mental crisis? Why are you not judging them in such a way that will allow you to make a diagnosis and route them to appropriate and actually compassionate treatment for what is troubling them? You are failing them. Royal College, NHS, the medical system, all of you. You are failing these people. You're failing us. You're failing children, and that's the worst, but you're also failing these people. Oh, they're sick and insane, all right. Absolutely. But they do, if you're in the business of helping, they do actually need help. You are actively calcifying their trauma. You are making it worse. This is, it's, it's iatrogenic mental illness. I mean, they're coming in presenting with prior mental illness, but you are actively collaborating to set that delusion, like glue that sets up and becomes hard. That's what you're doing. You are calcifying their trauma. You are cementing their personality disorders. <laughs> and you're doing this by positively praising what is obvious sickness and derangement and calling it beautiful and authentic. And patting yourselves on the back in The Guardian in public for your own narcissistic gratification. You pigs, you absolute pigs. Here's another quote. This draft guideline is our first attempt to ensure that we are providing personalized care for all our patients. We welcome feedback on this draft to ensure the guideline is the best it can be for clinicians and trans and gender diverse individuals who use our services. Personalized care. You hear this, right? This isn't medicine. It's the language of cosmetology boutiques that offer dermabrasion, Botox, nip and tuck, and other vanity services. It's just far bloodier. Me, mine, my way, authentic. Not for the first time I wish I believed in God because these people need smiting yesterday. I cannot wait for a flaming sword of justice. It can't come soon enough. I want to turn to the topic of autism in girls um, because I've talked a lot on the show about how young girls and boys who believe that they're transgender are usually victims of child abuse and neglect. And that is true. The vast majority of them are. For these kids, cluster B deranged parents rule the home. And many of these kids are being directly incubated by their parents and by the doctors into developing borderline personality disorder itself. This, this is, in fact, iatrogenic borderline personality disorder. But a sizable minority of these kids, usually girls, are autistic. Now, of course, it is possible for an autistic child to live in an abusive home, but I'm, I'm separating this out. I'm trying to make a distinction here. I, wanna, I want us to recognize that the state of having autism itself, not necessarily connected to any child abuse at all, can also funnel kids down this road, and it's happening a lot to girl children.
And it's because the autist's typical way of thinking, the rigid categorization, the binary yes or no, if I don't fit into this category, then that means I must only fit into this other category. Yes, I mean, in some ways it's, it's, it's splitting, right? It sounds like what we talk about in borderline personality disorder, but it comes from someplace completely different. It comes from the autistic neurological wiring. I have autistic children in my family. I've seen this firsthand. This is, in fact, how they think. Um, you know, so this autistic girl who's a tomboy, right, she can very easily come to believe that she's actually a real boy because boys and girls have to be in these separate categories, right, silos, walls between them. And if she has a helping of what you might call boy traits, that must mean she is a boy. She's in the wrong category. She has to go to this other category. And a new viewer um, pointed, I mean, I, I knew this, but Elsa, thank you very much. Um, for saying this because it gave me an opportunity to articulate it. I want to share with you what Elsa wrote. Uh, she said, in one of your episodes, I heard you mention the correlation in young girls between gender identity disorder and neurological issues, including autism. As an autistic woman myself, I think I can explain this. Autistic girls often go undiagnosed until adulthood, so they spend all their energy trying to pinpoint and then change what's stopping them from being normal. I think a lot of them today feel that being a boy is the answer, even if they're straight and not particularly tomboyish. Normally developing girls have unspoken social rules and hierarchies that autistic girls don't understand, and on the off chance that they do understand part of it, they think it's stupid and they won't follow along. As a kid, I hung out with boys and tried to fit in with them only, not because I was particularly tomboyish, but because it was so much easier and we could just ride bikes. I couldn't just ride bikes with girls. I would have been susceptible to gender ideology between the ages of 12 and 14 myself, just like we're seeing in girls nowadays. Thank you, Elsa. You're absolutely right. Thank you for saying it. And I want to remind you that if you want to talk about issues that are like what we talk about on the show, but that are happening in your personal life, uh, I'm open for business. Launched Slocum Consulting a couple of months ago. I'm offering sessions for people, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. This is not therapy. It's not professional mental health help. I am not a professional mental health helper. Do not want to be. Do not hold myself out to be. I am an experienced layman. I have met more cluster bees than you could shake a stick at. <laughs> so you've got a boss who's nice to your face but does you wrong with the higher ups and screws you on your evaluation. Maybe you've got a dad who's never satisfied with anything you do. He insults every effort you make and he still expects you to come home for Christmas and play nice and pretend that everything's loving and happy. Maybe you've got a mother who inserts herself between you and your wife. Belittling your wife is not good enough for her son. You could spin this out to people that you know at church or anywhere else. But if this sounds familiar to you, it's likely you have a difficult and problem person problem, but you're likely to have a cluster B problem in your life too. I can help. I can give you plain talk and straight advice from experience. There are ways to solve these problems. They're difficult. They're, they're in fact, they're some of the most difficult problems you will ever encounter. But there are solutions. What I can't help you do and no one can help you do this, you will not find anyone who can do this for you. So if anyone promises you they can do this, especially if they want money from you, they're lying to you. What I can't help you do is change the character of your mother or your father or your boss or your church deacon. That is not possible. We're not even going to talk about it. I can show you ways that other people have successfully put up barriers and boundaries around themselves and put this toxic behavior out of their lives to become happier and more content people. But that doesn't include changing the character of the person who's bedeviling you. If in fact the problem person in your life, this is their character, whether you judge them to have a personality disorder or not, that's it. That is who they are and that is who they will be until they die, almost all of them. But you don't even have to be sure that your problem person has a personality disorder. You don't even have to have what you consider a relationship problem. You want to talk about anything from uh, what to look for in finding an actual therapist to whether college or trade school is right for you. We can talk about that too. So 
If you're interested, go to joshuaslocum.net and book a session. I'd love to talk to you. See you after the break. You know how podcasters are always asking you to hit the subscribe button? Well, this is us asking you to take a minute right now and be sure you've hit subscribe on your favorite video platform. Click that notification bell too, so you never miss our newest content. And don't forget to subscribe on audio too. We have audio only content that you won't find on any video platform, so don't miss out. Do you like Disaffected? Do you like it enough to help pay for it? We'd love to have your support to grow and maintain this show. Donors get special access to our monthly Zoom hangouts. They're off camera and unscripted. We talk about what you want to talk about. There are two ways to join. Patreon users can go to patreon.com slash disaffected or visit subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Welcome back. By the way, wait till the end of the segment. I am going to tell you why this is the second, is this the second or third week that I've lied to you? Remember I told you I'm always gonna wear a suit jacket and then I didn't wear it because it was super hot last time. There's a different reason this week. It's actually very nice in Burlington today. Wait till the end of the segment and I'll tell you why I'm a liar. First, I wanna show you some, some women and some feminists who are uh, shouted down in public for standing up for their rights because there's a lot of this going on, especially in the United States. But well, I actually, I'm 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 gonna break the fourth wall as I often do, and well, I guess there isn't really a fourth wall because I'm already breaking it by talking to you. But I'm gonna tell you a little behind the scenes stuff about how I prepared this segment because I it really vexed me. You know from watching and listening that I hold professional feminism responsible for a great deal of the gender delusions that we're living under right now. Uh, contrary to what feminists claim, it's clear to me that certain strains of feminism, particularly liberal feminism, but also radical feminism, no, listeners, I know, and I know I'm going to hear from you too. You're going to say you're thinking of the liberal feminists, not the radicals. No, I'm thinking about you radicals too, okay? We disagree. Uh, certain strains of feminism have incubated delusions about gender for decades, and they've been very successful about it. They've denied the reality of sexed differences between men and women when they did not want those differences to be real. But they were very happy to point out the reality of sex differences that are useful and convenient to their interests. Uh, so, for example, the, the innate capacity for physical violence in men, which is real, uh, the fact that women can be impregnated and are therefore more vulnerable in a sexual encounter, that is also a biological reality. They will point these out when it serves their purpose, but they will hypocritically go back and pretend that none of the rest of it is real. But many women who call themselves feminists have indeed been sounding the alarm in the Western world about the trans incursion for years, and they've taken a lot of shit for it, undeserved shit. They're right to talk about the fact that it's alarming that men can now walk into women's locker rooms at the YMCA. They're right that it's alarming that school district, oh, the Department of Education, Joe Biden's Department of Education, is telling school districts they had better goddamn well let that 16-year-old man come into the locker room if he says he's a girl. They're right to scream about this. These women have been ignored, they've been mocked, they've been called lunatics, and they have often been left without effective police protection from assault when they raise their voices. All of this is absolutely unacceptable. I do not care how much I disagree with these women, and I do on many fronts, not all fronts. Nobody deserves this. And I would be the first one, even, in, and some of these women irritate me so damn much, I would still bodily put myself in front of them if some man was trying to threaten them. There's a basic level of decency, decency, and we all need to remember that we, should, that we have that duty. We have the duty to be decent to each other even when we disagree. This clip that I'm gonna show you is from a free speech event that took place this week in Philadelphia here in the US. They called it Speaker's Corner. I didn't know we had a Speaker's Corner. I thought that was something uh, that was only in um, the name of a particular corner in a park in London, but apparently we do. Um, 
a group of women took the podium to speak out against gender ideology, and I want you to see how they were treated. <clears throat> I'm taking this from a podcast called The Known Heretic. I haven't watched a full episode yet, but the host is a woman named Amy Souza, and um, I want to, um, I just, I want to show it to you. And the link for the, you can, this is about 25 minutes long. Uh, there's much more they're going to show you here, but it'll be in the show notes if you want to watch the whole thing. First, though, and I know I'm doing a lot of setup here, uh, in the interest of good faith and full disclosure, the speaker you're about to see here, her name is Kara Dansky, and she's a lawyer. Kara Dansky and I used to be friends. Um, she believes there's a patriarchy and that men are primarily responsible for the gender delusion. Obviously, I disagree strenuously with her. We drifted apart over that. Um, so unsurprisingly, Kara and I are not to each other's taste any longer. But she has worked very, very hard to fight this nonsense. She has traveled around the country. She has stuck her neck out. She does not mince words. She will go on Tucker Carlson on Fox News to get the word out. And she takes stick for, for that, too, mostly from other women. That's going to be the theme of this. Um, she deserves credit for this, and she doesn't deserve the nonsense that um, that's come her way. So let's take a look at this clip. I'm going to play you about two minutes of it. Introducing Kara Dansky, the wonderful, the one and only. Thank you, Jennifer. Great job, Gab. As Gab said, we are here in Philadelphia. We are here as women speaking. Right now, we are very near the Liberty Bell. In case you don't know, this is what the Liberty Bell says. We are here to proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. I have a quick message for our founding fathers, if they can hear me. Liberty is not just for men. We are here to proclaim liberation of women from male domination, and we will not stop doing it. Okay, I'm going to read from Article 4 of the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights. These people over here will not silence us, will they? No! Article 4, reaffirming women's right to freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. Shut the fuck up! Bye! Free speech! A woman just walked up and got in her face and said, shut the fuck up in the microphone. That was a woman. This is, this is how we're treated. When women try to speak, this is how we're treated. By other women, Kara. That woman is now trying to grab the microphone out of her hand. That is a lesbian there. That's a woman, not a man. This is what we're it is a man who actually helped you, Kara. Reaffirming women's right to freedom of opinion and freedom of expression. They're shouting, turf, go home, turf, go home. A woman is shouting this. States should ensure that women have the right to hold opinions without... Is that it? Is that the whole thing? Okay, good. All right. I'll tell you why this is particularly vexing for me, this segment, because when I sat down to uh, prepare this segment, I did so because I got a message from a viewer named Emily who said that I needed to see this, and she kindly gave me the link. And she said this uh, in her message to me. She said it was chilling to have men silencing and shaming women for speaking up to protect vulnerable women, but it was even more chilling to have other women doing the same. I'm shaken by the celebrated misogyny of the left. It's a dark time to be a woman in America. When I sat down to do this and look at this, I thought what I was going to see was an example of these troons, these, these males who call themselves women being aggressive. That's not what I saw. And I did watch the entire 25 minutes so, Emily, I have a question for you. I have several questions for you. I want to know why the first thing that you mentioned in your message to me was how chilling it was to have men silencing and shaming women. I'm asking you directly, Emily. Why? When it was women doing this.
Why did you mention men first? When it's women who bodily got in her face. By the way, I could be wrong here, but I did watch the entire 25 minutes. I, my eyes may fool me, I may make a mistake, but in good faith, I do not believe that I saw or heard any males harassing Kara. I believe that I saw aggressive Butch Dykes harassing her. I did not see one man try to get in her face, and I heard only women's voices. Emily, do you literally not see that? And yeah, I'm sorry. I, it, it, I'm person. It, yeah, I'm calling you out personally. I am. But this goes for so many women who I have not called out who've sent the same kind of crap to me before. You had better recognize reality, real quick, because what happened in this video was women. Butch Dykes got up in her face, tried to grab the microphone out of Kara's hand. One of them tried to tear her sign. And, and you know what? When one of them actually got literally up within five inches of her face, who stuck himself between Kara and that woman in her face? A man. And, who, and what kind of man? Actually, a man on the other side, a man who would have called you a turf. He actually dragged that woman out of your face. You're welcome, Kara. Emily, did you not see? No, I'm not going to ask you that. I know you did see it. Did you think that I was just going to sympathize with this? What was, what was going on there? Let me be clear. I hate that I just said that. I hate that I just said that. I sound like Bernie Sanders, and it's so obnoxious, and I'm obnoxious enough without sounding uh, like politicians who are always saying that. This behavior, my feminist correspondents, I don't know who you think you're talking to. My name's Joshua Slocum. Did you think you were watching a different show? Don't bullshit me. Don't ever bullshit me. I went from being sympathetic and wanting to cover it this way to being vastly unsympathetic. I'm not on your side. You and I are opponents, okay? We don't have to stay opponents because I think we probably have the same basic core moral decency, but until you pull your head out of your ass and you stop blaming your bullshit on men, I'm hostile to you. This is why I have left feminism. This is why I give no support to anything these women are doing. I want nothing to do with them, and I'm going to continue calling them out. You did this, women. Where are the good men? They've walked away. They've had enough of your crap. Don't ever send me something like this again. Yeah, I'm pissed. But I thank you for allowing me to show exactly how this distorted female thinking has taken over. Story time. A little bit that if I do this again, I'm going to call this sundry complaints. <laughs> because you guys seem to like hearing me bitch about stuff, and I like doing it. <laughs> so I got a few this week. More about the breakdown of civilization, the breakdown of society, the loss of basic etiquette. And again, a lot of this stuff may be peculiar. I don't think it's peculiar to my city and my state, I think, but I think it might be peculiar or vastly heightened in Democrat, progressive, and blue areas. So I know that this will not reflect what it's like for you if you live in Alabama or Texas, but this, there's a lot of parts of the country that are like where I live. Marijuana smoke everywhere. This is, this is one example. Now, I am a marijuana smoker in the evenings. Not during the day, not when I'm driving, not when I have work to do. Just, you know what, when I was an alcoholic, I never took a drink in the day either. This is apparently too much to ask of people anymore because over the past two years, two to three years, no, really, really two years, I have noticed Almost every day that I go out, whether I'm in my car or walking down the street, I smell huge marijuana from somebody's house or somebody's car. No, I'm not smelling only skunks killed by the side of the road. I know what I'm smelling. This is normal now. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't like to criminalize a lot of things 
I'm not, I don't approve of the cigarette smoking bans that have gotten out of control. I certainly don't want to see marijuana banned. I don't want people to stop from smoking it. I'm not even saying I want to be able to call the police and say, oh my God, somebody's smoking marijuana in the back of the shop. I wouldn't do that. I'm not that kind of person. I don't want this legally banned. But for God's sake, bros, and this is, this is a dude thing, you all act like, well, if you didn't want a contact high, like, you shouldn't have come into my store, bro. Grow up. Seriously. Can you, can we have any space that's not your personal luxury playground? Another one. Road rules, again. Or, or should I say bespoke road rules? Because we all get to have our own, me, mine, Customize. If this were a website, because you know how those websites are like this now, mycapitalone.com, mybrittawaterfilter.com, you know, because no one will remember the site unless we tell them it's their specific custom one for them. This would be like myroadrules.com, signed me. I'm downtown Burlington the other day. This is common behavior. This, this behavior has become common again in the past two years, right along with the marijuana smoking out in public. People simply take the right of way now. They run red lights. And I don't mean pushing stale yellows. I mean being stopped at a red light and simply deciding that that's unacceptable and traveling through it regardless. I'm in a four-way intersection and a woman in an SUV is in front of me and we're both stopped, the light is red other traffic is going perpendicular to us. Um, and then all of a sudden there wasn't other traffic. So it was one of those cases where everybody's sitting in a red light, even though there isn't any cross traffic. Yeah, I know it's annoying, but that's how red lights work. She just decided to go. She went from behind the line and just casually drove her way through there. I see this all the time. Often, I see accidents nearly take place because of this behavior. There have always been people who tailgated, always people who uh, don't know how to use the, the high speed lane on the highway and the slow speed lane on the right. This has always happened, but it has never happened to the degree, degree that's happening now. And the brazenness, I have never, before the past two years, I cannot recall ever seeing people actually simply drive through a hard red light when they were fully stopped before simply because they got sick of waiting. Maybe at midnight on a deserted road, I've done it, other people have done it too. Right out in daylight, this is three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then the dry cleaner. So this, this, is why, this is why I'm not wearing my suit jacket that I promised you I was going to wear because I adhere to rules of formality. Well, I waited too long to take my suit jackets in to get cleaned and they won't be ready till Tuesday. I would so like to blame this on the woman that I'm about to talk about, but honesty compels me not to do so. <laughs> I took two suit jackets into the dry cleaners. That's right, I rotate two of them. That's my entire wardrobe, now you know. <laughs> took him into the dry cleaners each of those suit jackets had a moderate amount of cat hair on it. Not an extreme amount. It wasn't like they had been sitting there and it was ground in. It was just, there was some cat hair, a little more than you could pick off with your hands. And I thought to myself, I'm going to get them cleaned anyway. I'll pay the upcharge to have them de-hair it. Uh, they'll do a better job than I can do anyway, right? This is, I, I mean, at least it always has been. I've always done this before. I believe, and I believe that I'm right, that this is something that dry cleaners expect and they offer this as a service. So I bring these in. There's two women in there, two employees. Woman comes over, asks if she can help me. Middle-aged woman, about 10 years older than me. So I put the, I put the suit jackets down and I, and um, actually before I set them down, I said this. Um, I understand that there's a, a, an upcharge for special attention like hair removal. And there's more hair on here than you usually get. I'm happy to pay for it. I realize I'm asking you for extra service above the base dry cleaning charge. So whatever surcharges you have to make, just please go ahead and make them. I'm not going to be one of those customers who pushes back on it. Thank you. I did this so that we didn't have to have that conversation 
and you've all had this conversation, especially, well, maybe all of you live in a blue area. You go to McDonald's and you ask them for an extra tartar sauce and you get this sort of, it's going to be an upcharge. Like, it's almost like they don't want you to do it because they're expecting that you're going to scream it. And I know that customers do. I've seen them. What do you mean? It's going to be 25 more cents for another well, this isn't a charity, right? I hate that conversation. I really, really hate it. So I try to preempt it. I try to signal that I'm nice, that I'm reasonable, that I understand that they're not a charity and that I have to pay for things. So that's why I did it. And I was very friendly about it, as I always am with customer service agents until they start shitting on me. Here is what the employee did. And I'm going to do her, OK? <laughs> I'll save that. So she comes over. 55-year-old Asian woman. Oh, 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 the worst, the worst. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Oh, hold on. I'm sitting I'm like, what? What? She's, she goes over to the other counter, gets one of those lint rollers, and comes back and then starts gingerly, like like this, like picking at the side of my jacket so she didn't have to touch it very much. And I felt like saying, bitch, put on a pair of gloves if you're so afraid of it. She's just rolling it. Oh, oh, he's disgusting. He's the worst. Oh, I know. Oh. <laughs> now, I wasn't laughing when this happened. It really pissed me. I, I was humiliated. I was, I was really embarrassed. I was like, this woman is trying to shame me, and I don't know why. So she keeps going this way. And I said, she was, she was actually communicating the level of disgust that would have been appropriate if I had brought in soiled underwear, underwear with skid marks and put them on there. That would have been an appropriate level of disgust for a little cat hair. So she seemed to be so upset by this that I, I said, I, wait, wait, ma'am. I, 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 reading between the lines here, I feel like I broke a rule and I'm not sure what it was. But did I do something wrong? Is that not a service you offer? If you don't, that's fine. I, I, I'm not trying to insult you. If you don't offer that service, I'll, I'll take it and I'll leave. Please just tell me. She would not answer me. She just kept looking disgusted and doing this. And I'm, I'm getting redder and redder in the face. Um, I know some people can let this roll off much easier than I can. There are reasons why I react this way. But that kind of social shaming... I have a very difficult time with, I, have a, I almost started crying. It hurts me a lot. I'm very sensitive to being socially shamed that way in public because I don't mean to break rules. I, I care about that. I don't mean to take advantage of people and I do make an effort not to do it. So when I'm treated that way, it's, I find it really hard to deal with. Um, so anyway, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what condition my jackets are, are gonna be on in when I pick them up on Tuesday. Um, but Gadu's uh, dry cleaning service in South Burlington, I hope you liked the detailed Yelp review. And I'll be giving you a call, too. All right, one more story, because we're going to end on a hopeful note this week. Look, I got all the way to the end and only blotted once. Oh, I can't wait for summer to be over. I went to Wendy's. <laughs> As one of my haters on social media said, your fat ass would go to Wendy's. Yeah, bitch. <laughs> um, what I was sure was going to be an absolutely hellish, unpleasant interaction that would make me want to kill myself actually left me feeling hopeful. So I go to Wendy's. I pull into the drive-thru. And I go up to the speaker. And this very polite voice says to me, Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to Wendy's. I'm sorry to tell you this, but we our computers are down right now. It's kind of a mess. But if you have cash, we can serve you and feel free to come inside. We'd be happy to help you. I. She was so nice. Because you, you know what you get? Sorry, computer's down. Sorry, closed. That's what you usually get these days. So it's like, thank you very much. I'll come inside with cash. Pull over, park, go inside. It's quite a line there. Um, their computers are down. None of the computers are working. Normally today, in 2022, when that happens, the staff, almost all very young people, simply close the store. They close the store. 
not these people. I felt like I'd been vaulted back 30 years in time. Do you know what they were doing? And they were young people too. They had pen and paper. They were working off a printed menu with prices. They were writing down customers' orders. Yeah. And they were doing the arithmetic and they were giving change back out of the till. I know, I know this is supposed to be normal, but when was the last time you saw people willing to do anything that wasn't convenient for them? They actually made sure that that restaurant stayed open and did its lunch trade, even though it was a little bit slower. They didn't give up and say, I can't. They said, okay, we'll do the math with paper and pencil. Congratulations, Wendy's, hats off. That's the show. I'll see you next week.